Thank you for coming to the Black Country this morning. I'm incredibly grateful to all of you for being here. I'm humbled to be in this position, the son of a docker and a school secretary, someone who left school at 16. I've worked in business all my life, but what I'm doing now is the most important thing I've done in my life. I've had some big challenges in my career. I advised the Japanese government after the 2008 earthquake. I worked with a housing executive in Northern Ireland following the Good Friday Agreement. And in the middle of the financial crisis, worked up the plan to ensure the London Olympic Village was transferred and converted to family housing afterwards. But there's no bigger challenge than the one we face today in our region. A decade of low economic growth, stagnating wages, the biggest tax burden since the Second World War, public services on their knees, and a crisis across our communities. But it's a challenge that Labour has a plan to tackle, and here in the West Midlands, I have a plan too. 150,000 new jobs and training places to support people into high-paid and quality jobs across every part of this region. I'll revitalise our high streets and bring back pride in our towns. I'll bring back buses into public control to, to put cheap and reliable transport in every corner of the West Midlands. I'll fix a housing crisis and crack down on rogue landlords, building more homes and, importantly, more council homes. <laughs> a problem that our Conservative Mayor has only just woken up to after eight years in office. A Conservative Mayor, by the way, who is working hard to pretend he's not a Tory. <laughs> it's like a fish pretending it can't swim. We can all see the blue rosette. And I'll be working hand in hand as one Labour team to tackle crime and antisocial behaviour to make our streets safer. We were once the workplace of the world. Whilst we're proud of our past, we're also ambitious about our future. We just need a fresh start with the Labour Mayor and the Labour Government working together to give us our future back. <laughs> and one of, the pe one of the key people in that government is someone I'm always impressed with. She doesn't just talk about change, she delivers it. The Deputy Leader of the Labour Party and my friend, ladies and gentlemen, Angela Rayner. <laughs> Thank you, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the capital of the black country today to launch Labour's local election campaign, and welcome to Dudley. Yay. People from around here really know what it means to graft. This town was one of the birthplaces of the Industrial Revolution. It was right here with a smelted iron thick in the air and limestone bricks towering high that Britain was built. It was Labour as the party of working people and the party for working people that empowered those workers to come together and unionise, to fight for better rights at work and keep more of what they earned. In the 20th century, when the sun had set on the quarries and the kilns, it was under Lat Attlee's post-war Labour government that this town saw council houses built on an unprecedented scale along with good, proper public services that people could rely on, with a history as rich as anywhere. We have come to the black country today as a signal of the future we want to build. Because somewhere in the time since the furnaces closed and the towering chimneys were torn down, the ambition of its people have been stolen through the greed of a politics which centralises power and wealth takes decisions away from the places and the people that know best and hoards the profits of growth at the centre, away from those who created it. Today in Tory Britain, our regions and nations are more divided than ever. Living standards are stagnating and the foundations of a good life are crumbling. Now, it won't have escaped you that where I'm stood here today is exactly where Boris once made his promise to level up Britain. But we can all see now what a burnt out shell that slogan has become. Like a car that's been nicked and then left behind a row of garages, only for the Tories 
to leg it out the passenger door the minute they get past the 2019 election. But you know, here in Dudley, people know better than most that the Tories took advantage of their hope. But once the votes were counted, they turned their backs. And so Keir and I have a responsibility to launch this campaign today with an eye on the road ahead. We know that it will be left to a Labour government, but also to Labour mayors and councils too, to deliver where this government has failed. And this cap-in-hand approach, where towns and cities are pitted against each other, and finally put out the dying embers of this patronising game the Tories play in the name of levelling up. As I always say, it's as if Michael Gove thinks he's an investor on the Dragon's Den, which lucky area will be successfully pitched, pitched for a small proportion of their own money back. So now instead of replacing this with some other cheap slogan, we have a real plan to rebuild Britain and create growth from the grassroots once again. So today, Keir and I are delighted to publish our plan to release Britain's untapped strength, to build an economy that works for everyone, to get growth in every corner of the country, and to put more money in people's pockets, to give people back control of what matters to them. We'll do this by ending the hoarding of power, so that the story we write together will be determined again by the towns and the cities that power Britain, and as a government, we will play our part. The Conservatives have taken a sledgehammer to the foundations of a good life. So working hard no longer guarantees a decent income, a secure home, or a good quality of life. <coughs> Labour will rebuild those foundations with an active centre of government. I've seen firsthand the difference that makes, and so has Keir. We grew up in different ends of the country and at different times. <laughs> Not too different. <laughs> but we endured the same insecurities and hardship that so many working people face. I guess the one difference is that I had to endure it as a ginger. So I've got one up there. But seriously, the council house, minimum wage, income support, tax credits, sure start, training and opportunities. They're the things that helped me and so many others. We delivered by different departments, agencies and levels of government. And of course, we delivered through the labour movement itself. As we did then, we can do it again. As once the workers of Dudley secured a better life for themselves, our new deal for working people will make work pay again. As once towns... <laughs> towns like this powered Britain, our green prosperity plan and industrial strategy will support the new jobs and industries of the future across the country. And as once Atlee's government built a generation of homes for local people, we too will rebuild Britain. So before I pass on to Keir, let me say this. I know that some who listen to my speech today will feel that twinge of scepticism in the back of their throat. And in part, that's because we have a prime minister who's political equivalent of that friend from back home who says he'll get the first round in if you pay for the taxi, and yet when you get to the bar, he's nowhere to be seen. <laughs> but that scepticism can pass and be replaced by everyday sort of hope for the future, a hope that once powered places like Dudley. So you have my word today that we won't make promises that we can't keep, you can believe that we're serious about fundamentally shifting the way Britain is governed. We seek power so we can hand it back to the people. That is the Labour way. It belongs to them, not us. Because more of the same just isn't good enough. Three word slogans, empty promises, broken as quickly as they were made, leaping from crisis to crisis, driven by vested interests, cronies, oligarchs, lobbyists who have had more say over the shape of the last decade than working families have. Never again.
We could now be months away from the reset of a nation. On the 2nd of May, the country has a chance to send the Tories a clear message, put an end to the chaos and the failure visible in every community up and down the country. Sewerage in our streams, crime on our streets, mortgages and rents that are sky high. It's time for change on the 2nd of May. We used to say the Labour Party is a moral crusade or it is nothing. Well, I'm telling you now that my moral crusade is to fight for working people who built this land so that they will benefit again from the growth that they create. And I'm delighted and proud to be joined in this crusade by our leader and the man who does always get his round in. <laughs> I give you our leader, future Prime Minister, Keir Starmer. Thank you all for that warm reception. It's really fantastic to see you all here in this room today. Thank you, Ange. Happy birthday. Yeah. It's Ange's birthday. What a treat we put on for her. Uh, and some advice for all of you, if you're thinking of getting in a round with Ange, don't be tempted by her favourite drink, the Venom Cocktail, or you'll live to regret it. Thank you, Richard, for your introduction. We are so excited about the vision you have for the West Midlands. And as Anne just said, it's great to be here in Dudley to launch Labour's local election campaign. The path to changing Britain to national renewal starts and begins here. And you can take it from me, we're not playing for a draw, we're looking to win in Dudley, looking to win in the West Midlands, right across the country, from Hastings to Hartlepool, a changed Labour Party on the march, on your side, return to the service of working people. Look, I do have to be honest, I was hoping we'd be launching a different election campaign here today, but the Prime Minister bottled it. He wants one last drawn-out summer tour with his beloved helicopter. So we need to send him another message, show his party once again that their time is up, the dithering must stop, the date must be set. Britain wants change, and it's time for change with Labour. <laughs> because the choice at these elections is exactly the same as it will be later this year. Stability with Labour, or more chaos with the Tories. Unity or division. Renewal or decline. A changed Labour Party ready to serve the interests of working people. Or a Conservative Party that has forgotten how to serve anything other than itself. And we can all see the consequences. Their failure is visible in every community in Britain. The sewage in our rivers. The ambulances that don't come. The schools crumbling over our children's heads. Mortgage and rent payments through the roof. And now, on top of this, this year, your council tax rising, a new Tory stealth tax coming soon to your letterbox. £300 per household. And they hope that you won't notice. In fact, they tell you that they're cutting your taxes while at the same time they're rifling through your back pocket, give with one hand and take even more with the other. 
and on and on and on it goes. Say the right thing. Do the exact opposite. Say we're all in this together, but decimate your public services. Say there's no downside for business, but rush through a careless Brexit deal. Say this is for ordinary people, but crash the economy to give tax cuts to the richest 1%. A party that is now so desperate, so broken by its failure to address your problems, that it has completely cut itself adrift from the responsibility of service. Reduced, with no record to defend, to exploiting Britain's problems for the politics of division. But look, here's the good news. They don't get to choose. You don't have to take it anymore. You can stop them. And that's the beauty of democracy. The power of the vote rests in your hands. And on the 2nd of May, you can reject the chaos, you can reject division, you can reject decline, and vote for national renewal with Labour. <laughs> because make no mistake, Labour has a plan to get Britain's future back a plan to drag politics in this country back to service, tilt our economy back towards the interests of working people, get us building again, working again, growing again, by unlocking the pride and potential of communities like Dudley. And that's what we'll... <laughs> that's what we'll be campaigning on during these elections. And look, I know some of you may have heard this kind of thing before. In fact, as Anne said, this is the reason we came to Dudley to launch this campaign. Because, of course, it was right here that the former Prime Minister, well, actually, the former, former Prime Minister, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm going to be accurate, gave his big levelling up speech, a project he said would turn the tide on regional inequality in this country and give a fair share to towns like Dudley. And, you know, People say to me, the worst thing you can do in politics is to prey on people's fear. Yet in some ways, preying on their hopes is just as bad. And that's what the Tories did with levelling up. Of course it struck a chord. Of course, a town like Dudley wanted that hope to be real. Not just the promise of a better future. We all need that. It's also how that project knowingly spoke to what towns like this have lost. The way of life that disappeared when the factories or pits closed. The community, the security, the, the chest out pride that grows when you are certain your contribution is respected. That what you do, what you make matters. And not just for your family, but for your community, your country, and even beyond our shores. A pride that looked out to the world and said, this is our place. This is who we are. Now, it was steel here, but the same is true of shipbuilding in towns like Hartlepool, car manufacturing across the region, mining everywhere from the chalk and clay of Essex to the coal seams of the Midlands and the North. I mean, look at the names of our football clubs. Stoke City. The Potters, <laughs> Stourbridge just down the road, the Glass Boys, Angie Stockport, the Hatters. Now, that pride is still there. Of course it is. And why not? I think Stockport gunning for promotion. <laughs> but over the years, it's a pride that's become a little less sure of the ground beneath its feet, in need of a stronger foundation, a government willing to see communities like this not as a charity case or a political client, but as a source of growth and dynamism ready to be unlocked. A partnership where politics offers you service rather than turning its back once it's counted your vote. Now, we understand that in the Labour Party. Trust me. What towns like this have been through over the decades, it's our history, our communities, and in many cases... 
the story which has shaped our families. My dad was a toolmaker. He worked in a factory. He always felt, particularly in the 80s, that he was looked down upon, disrespected. But equally, my sister is a care worker now. So I will never accept that it's only the work of the past which deserves our pride and respect. Uh, and that was the great lesson of the pandemic. It showed exactly who made up the backbone of Britain. The carers, the couriers, the driving, the teaching assistants, the warehouse workers, the supermarket staff, the nurses and the paramedics. The working people of this country, my Labour Party, stands with you. And that's my biggest frustration with these 14 wasted years. It's not just the stagnation, not just the price working people have paid, it's also the countless missed opportunities to give working people the power to drive our country forward, to bring people together outside of a crisis, unlock that pride people have for their community and harness it to change our country. Now, levelling up is a good ambition for Britain. Taking back control, if it means control for communities, not politicians in Westminster, that is absolutely essential for growth. But moving forward requires not just a new plan, but also a fundamental shift in how we govern. Britain's got an economy that hoards potential and a politics that hoards power. And it's no coincidence, no accident, that this leaves us with more regional inequality than anywhere else in Europe. So if we want to change our economy, we must also change our politics. And both these goals require things we know the Tories will never deliver. Economic stability, a commitment to service, a recognition that the sticking plaster approach to investment cost Britain more in the long run. That economic growth is not something that those at the top hand down to the rest of the country. And that a more dangerous world needs a more dynamic government prepared to step in alongside business and communities to deliver the security that working people need. Perhaps most of all, it needs an end to politics that is done to communities, not with them. No more political hero complexes, no more fantasies, no more easy answers that require nobody, politicians or anybody else, to lift a finger. Change comes from us all. I mean that. The Tory era of politics as performance art is coming to an end. But to get Britain out of this hole, we all need to roll up our sleeves. National renewal is a partnership. And I'm not here to tell you everything will be easy. That's what happened four years ago. Labour will give you a plan. We'll give you new powers to make a difference in your community. But look around your country. We need you. After everything you've been through in the past 14 years, I know this is a hard request to make. I know how little faith there is in politics to make a difference. But in your heart of hearts, I expect you know that this is what Britain needs right now. And coming together after all the chaos and division behind a credible long-term plan, a plan to back your potential, match your ambition, unlock your pride, so together we get Britain's future back. <laughs> so here's what voting Labour means this year. The change we offer for your community and our country. The new foundation we lay together that will give your family more security, unlock your community's potential, 
and generate economic growth from the whole country. It's a plan that starts, as it must, with economic stability. I mean, just look at the Tories now. Once again, in desperation, committing to the madness of unfunded tax cuts. £46 billion pounds to abolish national insurance, with no way of funding it other than risky borrowing or cutting your pension and our NHS. They're the only choices, whether they admit it or not. It's, it's like they think Liz Trust never happened. <laughs> uh, and maybe for their bills, for their mortgage, for their cost of living, it didn't. But out here, beyond the walls of Westminster, working people have paid an enormous price. No, policies have to be paid for. Every pound is precious. And this Labour Party, with Rachel Reeves as Chancellor, will value every pound as if it's yours, because at the end of the day, it is. And on that rock of economic stability, we lay our new foundation, five national missions, five new priorities to turn the page on Tory decline and walk towards national renewal. One, higher growth with a reform planning system, no longer blocking the homes, the infrastructure, the investment that the country needs. Two, safer streets with 13,000 extra neighbourhood police officers cracking down on the antisocial behaviour which blights too many of our town centres. Three, cheaper bills with GB Energy, a new publicly owned company, harnessing clean British power, not foreign oil and gas. Four, more opportunities for your children, more mental health support in our schools, expert teachers in every classroom, new technical excellence colleges, training our kids in the skills they need and businesses want. And five, our NHS back on its feet. Two million extra appointments every year. A plan to cut the waiting list. Start clearing the backlog. Rescue NHS dentists and end the ATM scramble at your GP surgery. And written through every one of these priorities, a new purpose, the fundamental mission of this changed Labour Party, to tilt this country back towards the service of working people, a return not just to the traditional Labour deal, but also the shift we need in the way this country creates wealth, a Britain that serves the interests of working people as they drive this country forward. And so, when we look at the opportunities clean energy and new technology can bring, we do so with a national wealth fund that stands with business, invests in the critical infrastructure our future growth needs, creates 650,000 new jobs, over 60,000 in the East and West Midlands, a plan that will relight the fires of renewal in communities like this. It used to be called industrial strategy, didn't it? And it's not an old-fashioned idea. In most countries around the world, it's seen as the bread and butter of responsible government. Because in a world as volatile as ours, with new technologies in life science, clean energy, artificial intelligence, all on the horizon, it is our job to make sure regions like this are backed with the investment that they need. The gigafactories that will make electric car batteries across the Midlands, the renewable ports ready to take offshore boom in the North Sea, the clean steel that can bring the next generation of jobs to Scunthorpe or Sheffield. And when we create jobs in communities like this, we do so with a new deal for working people. Not just because work should always provide dignity, but also because a labour market ribbled with insecurity is bad for productivity and bad for growth. So we will scrap zero-hour contracts, 
we will end fire and rehire, make work pay with a real living wage, and say unambiguously, this is good for growth. And on top of this new foundation, we will deploy the full power of government to deliver security for working people. But we will also give power away, put communities in control. A new Take Back Control Act with new powers for mayors over transport, skills, enterprise, energy planning, rejuvenating our high streets. And new powers to generate growth in every town and city. Local growth plans. That's the commitment we make today, a full fat approach to devolution. But with that, an expectation that those powers will be used to grow the local industries that are so important to unlocking pride. The argument is simple. Devolution is absolutely essential for taking on regional inequality. Democratic decisions are better made by local people with skin in the game. I always believe that. Because it wasn't some central planner who built the old round oak steel factory all those years ago. It wasn't a big politician who made Stourbridge famous for glass production, or the black country in Birmingham, the workplace of the world. No, that sort of pride is not in the gift of politicians. It's built up over the decades by the people, the businesses, and the workers of a community. In partnership with government, absolutely, that is vital. Leveling up doesn't happen by magic, but the energy and the drive must always come from a place itself. So when communities across Britain ask, what's our future in the modern economy? I say Labour will always respect your contribution. We will give you the tools you need. We will get the country's future back. But your destination, your decisions, the pride that defines who you are that belongs to you. And there is a power in that. A power which I believe can change this country. Let me put it this way. At some point in your life, many people here will have heard a doubting voice inside saying, no, this isn't for you. You don't belong here. You can't do that. Working class people certainly hear that voice. Trust me. And in a strange way, perhaps it's that kind of insecurity industrial communities feel when they look to the future. But imagine if instead a whole country said, you do belong. Imagine if a whole country said, we back your potential. Imagine if a whole country commits properly to unlocking the pride you have for your community. Then look what we could build. A Britain where every contribution is equally respected. Where you don't have to change who you are just to get on. Where whatever your background, you can feel certain that your effort will be rewarded. The future will be better for your children. A Britain strong enough for you to invest your hope, your potential, your pride. A country we can build together. That is the change we offer. That is Britain's future. To get it back, vote Labour on the 2nd of May. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Fantastic to see you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right. 
Um, I'm now going to take a number of questions from the press, and I've got a list here. I'm going to start with Mark from the Express and Star. Do we have Mark? Mark, can I just say before you um, start, um, our condolences. Uh, Pete Maidley, um, one of your journalists, passed away. Last time I saw you, he was very ill. Um, please pass our condolences to his family and to all of your staff. It must be a very, very difficult time for everybody um, at the Express and Star. Well, dear, thank you very much. That's much appreciated. 35 years ago, this was a bustling, thriving town, three big department stores. You could buy anything. Um, since then, under both Labour and Conservative governments, it's been a best managed decline. It's, it's, it's suffered more than most towns have in this country. Uh, the moment the government has proposed that everything got plans for um, an Eton College building and for the university, an Eton College had a sixth form to give children from deprived backgrounds a chance to get Eton education and demolish the Hippojam Theatre to build a university campus. My questions are, can Dudley become the thriving town it was in the 1970s, 1980s, and what are your thoughts on these regeneration proposals that the present government is putting forward? Are they enough, and what would Labour do differently? Um, the answer to the question is yes, it can become a thriving town and place again, and I'm determined that it will. And the phrase you used then, manage to climb, is the phrase that should eat away at all of us, because that is the feeling in too many places across the country. But for that to happen, we need a viable plan, and we need to do the hard yards. And as Angela said, levelling up is not a slogan. It's got to be a viable plan and the hard yards of a plan that will actually work across the country. The number one mission of an incoming Labour government will be to grow the economy. But not just to grow the economy, which is vital, but to grow it in every place across the country. Not to have it grown in some parts of the country and redistribution to be the one-word answer for other places. So we will work to rebuild Dudley and all the other places and cities across the country with the hard yards and the viable plan that we put forward this morning. Thank you, Mark, very much. I've got Lewis from ITV Central. Hello, Lewis. Okay. Love um, Lewis. So, first of all, I mean, uh, some voters across towns like Dudley, uh, right across the Midlands, are still really unsure about whether... Uh, Labour really does have their best interests at heart. There's still a bit of convincing to do there, I think. What can you say today that will convince people uh, that, that uh, you do have their best, best interests at heart? And given the fact that we are here in Dudley today, I wonder too, what does the black country mean to you? Well, look, I think, I mean, this is such a good question because one of the most important things in politics is being clear that you get it, you understand how people feel about themselves, their family, their community, their place. Um, and across the black country, it is important that we feel it, we understand it, that emotion that comes with place. And we talk about managed decline, but alongside that's a huge pride. Everywhere I go in the black country, there's an amazing pride people have in their place, their high street. It means something to them. In many ways, I feel they're screaming out for a government that simply matches their ambition and comes up alongside it. So in terms of the emotional connection, I completely understand. The answer then is, well, if you do understand um, how we feel, what we want, the ambition that we have, and you're prepared to come up alongside us, have you got a viable plan to do it? And that's why the local growth plan is so important, because that is local, it's based in place, it's about people with skin in the game, uh, playing their full part, but alongside a national strategy that works. That is hard yards, and my frustration of the past 14 years, but particularly since 2019, is that in saying levelling up, the government was tapping into something real that people yearned for, but they didn't have a viable plan and they didn't do the hard yards. That's unforgivable. And we intend to turn that around and make sure that we can make that connection real and change places across the black country. Thank you for your question. I'll go, please, to Beth. Thank you. Um, Beth Rigby, Sky News. Um, Keir Starmer, you're framing these elections as a national moment, and if the polls are right and there's real enthusiasm for Labour, you'd expect 1996-style numbers, Labour shooting up by hundreds of councillors and the Conservatives losing even more. Isn't anything short of that a sign you're not in landside territory? And just quickly, your 
talking about devolution, but there is an immediate crisis with one in five council bosses saying they think it's fairly or fairly likely they'll go bust in the next 15 months. The Local Government Association calculates that there is a £4 billion funding shortfall in the next two years. Will you commit that money? Thank you. Well, Beth, thank you. And, and let me address both parts of that. Um, the first thing to say, just from the very beginning of your question, Beth, is obviously what we've got on May the 2nd is the mayoral and local elections, and later in the year, the national elections. But they go together. Because what we want to do is to make sure that the local and the national are integrated. And this is the first part of a two-part series, if you like. And that's why 2nd of May is so important. And look, I acknowledge um, that we need to work very, very hard to win that election. I say to my shadow cabinet every week that in order to get from where we landed in 2019 to even a two- or three-seat Labour majority will require a bigger swing than 1997. That's a sobering thought. That's why we've been disciplined, focused, changed the party, exposed the government as not fit to govern, um, and are absolutely intent on putting our plan for Britain before Britain. That's the opportunity that we have now. We will continue to do that. We have gone from a, from a party that um, has suffered the worst loss since 1935 to a serious contender as we go into that election. Uh, and I say to my shadow cabinet, put the polls to one side. It's the hard yards of focus and discipline and being clear that we're delivering for the country and, and have one thing in mind, that we will restore this country to the service of working people. That's the chance that we have to turn this country around. And Beth, you're quite right to then focus on the appalling situation in which many councils have been put um, across the country. And there's no playing political games on this. Um, councils of all political stripes are struggling with the lack of funding they've had over a prolonged period. Um, and we need to turn that around. We will do that. I think there is scope for different kinds of funding settlements. Talk to any council leader and they'll say the one-year settlements are very difficult for us because we can't spend money effectively and as well as we should. So it's hard because there isn't enough money. It's even harder because it's one-year settlements. We can change that around with three-year settlements. I can't pretend that we can turn the taps on, pretend the damage hasn't been done to the economy. It has. The way out of that is to grow our economy, and that takes me back to the plan that we're launching today. Thank you very much, Beth. Can I go to Paul, Channel 4, please? Paul. Morning, Sakir. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, too. Just picking up from Beth's question there, the plan to empower local communities through devolution, isn't that radical? You said it yourself, it's pretty much Boris Johnson's levelling up 2.0. But the one thing that all local authorities say is they haven't got enough money. So are you committing to real levelling up with real new money for the levelling up fund and for local authorities? And we'll be more than happy with just a simple yes or no answer. Well, you've asked me four questions, so that's a little bit tricky. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, beating Beth. <laughs> um, but look, I mean, firstly, um, levelling up requires the hard yards and a viable plan. It didn't have one. Um, and that's why four years on, I think, if you go around the country, and I know you do, asking people, do they feel they've been levelled up, they feel that they're better off now than they were? The answer will be a resounding no, because you can't come up with a slogan and pretend that's going to change the state of places. It's much harder work than that. And that's what the politics of service is all about. Um, on the mayoral um, uh, aspect of this and the devolution, yes, some of that devolution has happened through existing mayors. There's other mayors that are up for grabs at these elections. But there is then the question of how a government works with the mayors. At the moment, what you've got, and you see this across the country, is national government working against or in conflict with mayors, not with them. That's a mindset change that we have to break down. I want the partnership of, as it were, city or place with country coming up alongside each other. On the question of the money, um, one of the shocking statistics is this, that only 10% of the levelling up money has actually been distributed. Let that sink in. This great promise, and 10% has been distributed because there wasn't a plan to get the, 90, the other 90% out there. So we can change that straight away. That is unlocking a huge amount of money by being clear about the plan, the structures that we're going to put in place. So that does release a huge amount of money. And, and yes, of course, I want to invest more in our public services, in our public places, 
um, and our local authorities. We're going to have to work hard to do that. I can't pretend we can do that on day one. What I can say is we'll roll our sleeves up, we will grow the local economy, we will make sure that private investment comes in. There's no end of investors that say to me, I would come in if I could see a viable plan that I could get behind, but at the moment I don't. And so it's not as simple um, as sort of a two-word slogan. It's much harder yards than that, and that's what we're absolutely committing to today. Thank you, Paul. I've got Amy from ITV. Um, Amy. This is my ITV News. Morning. I've got a couple of questions, if that's all right. I'll start off with... Well, <laughs> it's mostly <laughs> <Not> one four. <laughs> each. Um, Beth didn't do it. Well, it's one and a half. She merged it. I'll separate them, if no. that's all right. Um, Angela Rayner, your deputy, is here today. Happy birthday. Greater You're not Manchester. Spoil that day, are you? <laughs> I might be. Greater <laughs> Manchester Police said last night that they're considering or reconsidering investigating her. Does she have your support, and are you concerned that this is going to overshadow what you're trying to achieve? Angela has my full support and my full confidence today and every day as we work together uh, to take the Labour Party back into government, so that we can serve the interests of working people. And she's vital for that. And your follow-up? Follow-up question on that. Um, obviously, when it comes to devolution, there's been a lot of talk about this um, today. Is it right that perhaps for you the opposition isn't the Tories, but actually the fact that voters believe that no one can achieve this, no one can level up at the moment? I mean, that's such an interesting question. I mean, the, the, the opposition is the Tories, of course, um, and we intend to take them on, and we are. But one of the terrible things they've done, in my view, is to beat the hope out of people over the last 14 years. And therefore, I completely understand why some people say, I quite like what you're saying, but can anyone fix this after the mess that they've made? That's a terrible reflection on the Tories. People look around and see their public services broken, the NHS almost unable to cope, their community no better off now than it was 14 years ago, them not feeling better off, and of course, they question whether anyone can change this. And so our task going into the election is obviously to put our plans, um, local growth plans, forward for levelling up and making sure that we can change you know, the real material position on the ground. But we've also got to give people hope, hope that politics can change, that we can return to a place where promises matter, where values and standards in public life matter where you don't see your politicians simply looking to enrich themselves, to get more advantage for themselves, resigning because they didn't get put in the House of Lords. What message does that say? And that's why I say as often as I do, it's a really good question you've asked, and a really serious one, that we must return politics to the service of working people. I've been serving all my life. I believe in service. I fundamentally believe in it. And I want politics to return to service so that when people are elected in a Labour government, they know that's a government that's going to serve me. And that way, I think we can turn around that underlying feeling, which I completely understand people have after 14 years, that perhaps nothing can be done. It can, we will, but we need to restore that sense of service. Thank you very much, uh, Amy. Uh, Ian. So we're all standing up here for some reason. Uh, okay. Um, Not for me, you don't know. <laughs> Uh, let me just follow on a little bit from, from that question because we've been speaking to people in Dudley and uh, we've been struck by the fact that some of them really don't think that you can make substantial change. It's a disillusionment more of politics than any one particular political party. But obviously there are things you can do to restore confidence. So I'm going to ask a very specific question. You talked about the decimation of public services. You talked about hope. The councils that fear they're going to go bankrupt in the next year will need more than hope. They'll need hard cash. Can you guarantee that a Labour government in its first year will give them more resources than the Conservatives are giving them now? Well, um, insofar as we can unlock the money that has not been unlocked, the 90%, insofar as we can change the funding formula so that it's three years, not one year, then yes, we can do more for... Um, our local authorities, our local councillors, our public services. And believe you me, I believe in public services. I, work, I ran a public service for five years, so um, this is something core about who I am and what I believe in. Um, but can I stand here and pretend to you that there's a magic money tree that we can waggle on the third of, um, or the day after the 
um, election. No, they've broken the economy. They've done huge damage. And even now, in their budgets, they're using any potential money for public services for gimmicks. This is a very different Tory party. This is a Tory party that's lost any sense of the national interest and is now passing budgets in their own party interest. That happened at the last budget. If they get the chance, they'll do it again. The only purpose of that is to stalt the ground for an incoming Labour government. It's very important people understand that. So we'll pick it up. We'll support our public services and our local authorities. And we will make sure they're in a better position after a Labour government they were when we picked it up. But what's happened now is unforgivable, which is to leave your country after 14 years of government in a worse place than you found it is unforgivable, whichever political party you're in. But that's the state we're in. Thank you very much, Ian. I've got... Chris. Uh, Christopher Hope, GB News. Um, so, Keir Starmer, you said you want no more political hero complexes, but in recent weeks, David Lammy, Rachel Reeve, Reeves has praised Margaret Thatcher. Today, you've praised Boris Johnson's levelling up um, policy. You've got a Take Back Control Act. Obviously, Johnson is not your political hero, but why are you, no. praising, <laughs> but why are you praising Tories? Why are your critics to say you're a Tory in disguise? Well, um, look, when I was speaking about Margaret Thatcher, I was singling out um, leaders, prime ministers, who I believed had a sense of mission, a sense of driving purpose. Now, I don't agree with her mission or her driving purpose. In fact, she did very destructive things across the country, including in the black country. Uh, and, and people are still paying the price of that. But I do think it's important to distinguish between leaders who have a, a driving sense of purpose, what they're trying to achieve, a sense of the hard yards of five or ten years in government and leaving something better afterwards, than those that drift. And what have you got at the moment? What is the driving philosophy of Rishi Sunak, apart from survival? What does he st I mean, people ask me, what does Labour stand for? What does Rishi Sunak stand for? He's just treading water. He's waiting, waiting. He knows the country wants change. He knows they wanted, on the May the 2nd, to have a general election. But he's treading water, preserving himself, party interests. And I think, that's, I think this is linked to the point Amy was made. I think that's why a lot of people are losing faith in politics, and we have to turn that around, Chris. It's very, very um, important. Um, as for Boris Johnson, look, hands up, I'm no fan. Um, <laughs> uh, and I do, to, to tap into something like levelling up, which really, and levelling up as an idea has been around a very long time. Regional inequality um, wasn't first discovered in 2019. It's been deep for many, many years. But in tapping into that and promising that that would all change with a slogan, and then not having a viable plan, and not doing the hard yards. I mean, that is why politics is broken. That is why people don't believe in their politicians, because he pretended it could happen. He didn't do the hard yards. And that's why I think everybody is pleased to see the back of it. Thank you, Chris. Um, Nick. Uh, Nick from The Telegraph. Uh, hi, thank you. So, yeah, um, I have a question on uh, access to open justice, which I'm sure is an, an issue close to your heart. Um, there's been a lot of controversy recently around the single justice procedure where tens of thousands of people a month are being convicted in secret behind closed doors, often in their absence. Uh, at the same time, newspapers had to um, take legal proceedings to get um, the details of the Abdul Azidi immigration appeal. So um, what will Labour do on open justice? Do you think that single justice procedure should be reformed and should immigration system uh, appeal decisions be routinely published? Well, I think there are two parts in that question, Nick, um, which require slightly different answers. As to journalistic access, I think that's really important. And I think we do need to ensure that there are mechanisms in place for journalistic access all of the time. Now, it's much harder, as you know, because um, back in the day, there were reporters in a lot of our courts all of the time. Um, now, the resource doesn't allow that, and or it's more difficult to reach those cases. But our courts and our justice should be open, accountable, and that means that the eyes and ears of journalists should be able to get in there. And that's a very important fundamental principle as far as um, I'm concerned. On the broader question of open justice, we need to get the balance right. There are you know, thousands upon thousands of cases that um, are dealt with in our magistrates' court, but not necessarily uh, in an open and full court hearing. And it would 
um, imp impose a huge burden on the court system if you, if you change that around, where people are pleading guilty by post or whatever it may be. And you wouldn't want to turn that around and say there must be an in-person hearing for every single one of those cases. That doesn't mean journalists shouldn't have access to it, um, or it shouldn't be open in the sense that people can find out what's going on. But we do need to get the balance right. But the first point you make is a very important one about journalistic access, which I fundamentally support and always um, have done. Thank you, Nick. I've got Jessica from The Guardian. Jessica. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Um, while we're all very aware of the, the wider financial crisis facing local authorities in the country, um, we're obviously just down the road from um, Birmingham, where the council declared effective bankruptcy last year after a series of financial mishaps, which councillors have admitted to and apologised for, and obviously a similar situation in Nottingham. I mean, do you have concerns about what impact this could have um, for Labour at the local elections in May? Um, and just also quickly, you said that um, Labour would ban fire and rehire practices. Could you just clarify whether that would also apply to Labour councils such as Coventry, where uh, councillors are reportedly pushing ahead with plans to fire and rehire bin workers there? Uh, well, look, on council finances, um, well, you, you, you pick out Birmingham, but there are plenty of councils across the country that are in financial difficulties. I think, and Richard will have better statistics on this than me, there's been about a billion pounds of cuts or money taken out of Birmingham over the last decade or more. That's very difficult. And I know people in Birmingham who rely on the services are very worried about that because they worry about the impact it's going to have um, on them. The only way through this is to have a better funding settlement and to have those plans in place to grow the local um, economy and to have a council in a sense that the government wants to work with councils, mayors, combined authorities, rather than simply w working against them and trying to blame other people. On fire and rehire, look, I'm against it, and that means I'm against it wherever it is. Um, and it's as simple as that. I'm not going to wade into an industrial dispute. Uh, that wouldn't be right. But um, I'm against fire and rehire. I'm against it wherever it is and whoever is practising it. Thank you very much, Jessica. <laughs> Uh, Christian from the Express. Hello. Uh, last year, during a Tory minister's tax route, Ms Rayner said if he's lied and misled the public in HMRC about his tax, his position is untenable. During the Beergate route, you said you would resign if found to have broken COVID laws. Should your deputy resign if she's found to have broken any rules? Well, look, Angela has answered, I don't know how many questions about this. She's not broken any rules. She's, in fact, taken legal and tax advice, um, which has satisfied her and us and me about the position. And I think when I look at this in the round, um, and it goes back to Beergate, the fact that the Tory party is spending more of its time and energy pursuing this issue... <laughs> rather than answering the question and of accountability for what they've done after 14 years as we go through an election. Tells you everything you need to know about them. Uh, I've got Jack from The Sun. Jack. Thank you, Sakir. Can I just follow on from that? Um, you just said that the advice given to Miss Rayner has satisfied herself and you. Last week you said you hadn't seen that advice. Have you now seen it? Should she now publish it in the aims of maximum transparency? And if not, are you holding Tory MPs to a lower standard which you and her uh, are holding uh, each other? Well, look, Angela's been very clear. I think she's been doing media this morning, but she's made it very clear that if anybody wants more information from her, any of the authorities, she's more than happy to provide it. But should she publish legal tax uh, 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 advice? No, she shouldn't. Uh, and where does this end? Are you, Jack, going to be calling for Tory ministers to publish all their legal and tax advice going back over the last 15 <laughs> years? <laughs> That's where this ends. Thank you. Uh, Kamail from the Mail. Uh, yeah, Kamail Mail. Jaffa, Daily Mail. Uh, you've accused the Tories of preying on the hopes of people and then turning their back on them after they get elected. Uh, you yourself have obviously, you turned on a number of policy promises. So how can voters trust you not to do the same thing that you've accused them of if you're elected? What I've done is to take difficult decisions before the election about what we can deliver. Sometimes that has required us to adjust our position. So if you take some of the commitments we made on £28 billion, 
since we made that commitment, the Tories have done enormous damage to the economy. And therefore, we've had to adjust our plan. I would rather level with the British public before the election and tell them straight what we can do and what we can't do and then deliver on what we say we can do rather than do what Boris Johnson did at the last election, which is to pretend he could deliver everything and then deliver nothing. Because that leads you back to Amy's question, which is why do people not have faith in their politics? So I've taken a tough decision to not do things which an incoming Labour government might have wanted to do more quickly. But I've done it by looking down the barrel of the camera and saying to the British public, I will not make promises that I cannot deliver. And I'll say that before the election so you know where you stand rather than after the election when it will turn out to be a broken promise and lead more people to think that they can't have trust in politics. Thank you, Kamel. <laughs> and... Lizzie from the Mirror. Hi. Lizzie. Hi, Keir. Lizzie Buckingham from the Daily Mirror. Um, there's been some speculation in recent weeks that the New Deal for working people could be watered down due to pressure from business leaders. Can you guarantee that it would be implemented in full in the first term of a Labour government, including a ban on zero-hours contracts? Yes. Uh, 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 and let me tell you for why, because I believe deep down that respect and dignity at work matters. This goes back to what I said about my dad. It really matters that people feel respected, uh, that they feel that they have their dignity at work. But there's an additional reason, and that is every good employer knows that if you do treat people with respect and dignity at work, then that increases productivity. That increases the growth in your business uh, an enterprise, and it's actually good for the economy. And that's why when I talk to employers, most good employers are doing all the things in our new deal in any event. But yeah, we're absolutely committed to it, and we will be implementing it, and Angela's leading from the front on that. Happy birthday, Angela. Thank you all very much. Thank you.